So what is up, guys? Uh, this is the very first episode of the Flimsy Hat Podcast. Uh, so I have here Terry Tucker. Um, just a little bit of background on Terry Tucker. He's from Chicago. Uh, he played Division One basketball, and he also has a degree in criminal justice administration and business administration as well. Correct. Correct. Um, so he's been kind of all over the place. Uh, he's worked in Wendy's as a marketing coordinator. He's been a program manager. He's been a police sergeant. Uh, and he has recently just wrote a book as well. So, um, Terry, I want to kind of take off and just kind of give us a little bit of the background about yourself. Sure. Well, Sal, thanks for having me on the inaugural podcast. I'm really <laughs> excited to, to be here with you. So give you a little rundown here. So I am the oldest of three boys. You can't tell this from looking at me, but I'm six mm. foot eight inches tall and uh, played college basketball at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. I, I was very fortunate that I actually got to play against Michael Jordan his freshman year in, in college and kind of a funny story. So my youngest brother is a basketball coach in Chicago and coached Jordan's two sons in high school. And he always tells the story. So one day I was in practice and I was, you know, teaching the kids a play and I looked up and nobody's paying attention to me. So I look where the kids are looking and it was by the door and Jordan had come into the gym as a parent to pick up his kids, you know, take them home after school. And my brother looks at him and says, Hey, Michael, you know, you're a little bit of a distraction. Would you mind stepping out in the hall until after practice? And Jordan was a super guy. He and his wife were both super. And, and so he's like, yeah, sure. Coach, no problem. And later my brother was like, you know, I'm probably the only coach in the history of basketball that ever kicked Michael Jordan out of practice, you know? So, <laughs> so anyway, so, uh, you know, played basketball at the Citadel, graduated, moved home. I'm going to really date myself now, Sal. This was long before the internet was available. At the time <laughs> and, and, you know, I was all set to make my mark on the world with my newly obtained business administration degree. But, you know, I look back now, I realize what a knucklehead I was to think I knew anything about business just because I had a degree. Fortunately, as you mentioned, I found that first job in the corporate headquarters of Wendy's International. Uh, unfortunately, I ended, I ended up living with my parents for the next three and a half years as I helped my mom uh, care for my grandmother and my father, who were both dying of different forms of cancer. You touched a little bit on my resume, so I won't go into that. And then I guess finally, my wife and I have been married for 28 years. We have one child, a daughter. She's a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and is an officer in the new branch of the military, the Space Force. Very, very cool. Um, so I guess what's the uh the space force? What is that when you heard that? What was your first like thoughts on that when your daughter told you that? I, I had absolutely no idea. And and several years later, I still have absolutely no idea. It, it is all top secret, it is all you know, stuff that she can't talk about. All I know is that she flies military satellites around the heavens, and that's that's as that's as much as I as I need to know, according to her. That that's kind of cool. Like, that's cool. At least you yeah. can say like, "Hey, I was the first one to like be in this branch of military." Nobody else can say that. That's exactly. just like that's I mean, just you're cool. On the ground floor, yeah. Like that's cool. Like you can't say, "Oh, I was the first one in the army." Like, right? Nobody's living that was like like that. So that's that's just like really cool to experience that, especially I guess as a parent. Like, my daughter's the first one to be in the space force. That's yeah. That's it, that's amazing. It, 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 it is. And then she just got married in October and actually her husband is a is a pilot in the Air Force and okay. also graduated from the academy and that. So they're they're getting ready to actually on Wednesday move down to Florida. That'll be uh, her new assignment. He's already down there. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, I have a lot of family in Florida. I actually used to live in Florida when I was a kid. Um, mm-hmm. So that was that was different. Um, so like what experiences from your youth kind of shaped who you were, like who you are today? I think the biggest thing was was my my basketball experience. I mean, growing up in Chicago, you know, I mean, it's a it's kind of a mecca for basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I was, um, you know, when I was in high school and I was like 15, 16, I ended up having three knee surgeries. And, you know, one of the things I learned was the, the need to control your mind. And okay. when I went back playing basketball, you know, my brain was putting all this negative garbage into my thoughts, you know, things like. Hey, you know, you had these three surgeries, you're probably a step slower and coaches aren't going to want to recruit you. Mm. And, and I was like, wait a minute, I'm still playing at an elite level and I'm still being contacted for coaches by coaches to possibly play at their college university. So, you know, you, you kind of had a 
change that narrative. You got to flip that switch and be like, no, you know, I, I am still playing at a, at a great level on that. And, you know, your mind can hold one thought at a time. Why would you make that a negative thought? And and you and I were talking earlier before we started. You know, I, I remember guys when I was in college that would go out the night before a big test and, you know, get blitzed and then come into the test. And, and what, what do they always say? Oh, man, I'm, I'm going to blow this. I'm going to blow this test. Why would you say that to yourself? You yeah. know, why wouldn't you at least give yourself the benefit of the doubt and be like, you know what? I paid attention in class this semester. I'm going to do great on this test. Why would you immediately go to the negative? And I've had several people during my cancer experience who've said to me, Terry, I could never do what you did. And I kind of flippantly tell them, yeah, you're right. You couldn't because you've already decided in your head that you can't do this. And, you know, Bobby Knight was a, a big basketball coach at University of Indiana, you may remember. Mm -hmm. And I played in high school against one of his probably better players, Isaiah Thomas, who won a national championship with Indiana and won several NBA championships with the Pistons. And yeah, I remember Isaiah would come home and we would talk and he would say, you know, Knight had this philosophy that mental is to physical as four as to one. You know, here's this great coach teaching these elite athletes how to use their bodies. But what he's really saying is your mind is four times more important than all this physical stuff that I'm doing with you. Yeah, I find that fascinating that you said that about the mentality. Like, I feel like in sports like youth sports and college sports that like there's not enough emphasis on the the mindset and the mentality going into a game. Uh, and I know like from experiences, I, I coach high school football. So like, I know like something that like we don't have all the time is like those big athletes that are big, strong, fast. Right. So like our main focus is that, that mindset of putting the kids like, Hey, you have to be here on time. We need to practice. Right. And only you are in control of the situation that you put yourself in. Right. So I just find it fascinating that, that you said that. Cause I, I, th I agree hundred percent with that. Um, that's a great, great piece of advice there. Um, so kind of like shifting gears. Um, what is your definition of like a good leader? And then like, what, like a bad leader, like if you had to get like, you give an example, cause I mean, you've, you've been all over, I'm sure from corporate law enforcement and stuff like that. I'd like to hear kind of like both sides, like in maybe both uh, business and law enforcement, like both a good leader and a bad leader. And I, business. I, I guess, I guess let me start with with the negative, with the negative side. I, I, and I, I've been in meetings like this, you know, when you're in business. So there's mm -hmm. a there's a problem or there's an issue. Now, I a, a bad boss is going to come in and do this, going to come in and sit like, OK, here's what the issue is. Here's what I think we ought to do. You know how I think we can solve it. Great. OK, let's go around the table. Everybody, you know, tell me what you think. And what usually happens there is people just reiterate in some version what the boss just said. Now, a yeah. good boss is going to come in and do this. It's going to sit down and be like, okay, here's the problem. We've identified the problem. How do you guys think we should solve this? And if you do that, you give people the opportunity to say, well, hey, you know what? What if we tried this? Or what if we tried? Because the boss hasn't given his or her definition of how they're going to solve it. I mean, you're, you don't want to commit suicide by saying, you know, hey, boss, I know that's how you want to solve it. Let me tell you how we should solve it. People don't do that. It, it, that, that doesn't happen. And so I, I think a good boss is more, you know, we always hear about leaders lead from the front. I'm not so sure that's true. I think leaders lead from the back in terms of what do you need to be successful? I'll be back here getting it for you. I'll be doing the things that need to be done so that you can be successful. From a law enforcement point of view, I, I think the biggest thing about, a leader, at least the ones that I thought were were good, were the, the people that were kind of in the trenches with you. I'll, I'll never forget this when I became a boss. Uh, I, I had a captain come to me, and, and, and this wasn't even my report. It was somebody else's. And, and it was a run where there was a woman sitting on a, um, a, a Cadillac convertible. And, you know, the top was down. She was sitting on the back seat, and she had a gun. And, and the officers got there. They got behind cover. They ordered her onto the ground, you know, drop the gun. On, then they didn't see a gun, but they ordered her onto the ground. Well, eventually, they tased her from a distance, from a safe distance. Well, the captain comes to me and is like, why didn't they just walk up on her? And I'm like, Captain, you understand this was a gun run. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. this woman potentially would have had a gun. How would you have felt if she had pulled a gun out? We, we're going to three police funerals. 
I, I'm like, I don't understand why you think they should have gotten up on her. I think they tactically did what they should have done. And I think that's a boss that's out of touch. That's somebody who's I'm in my office all day long and I don't mm-hmm. understand what's going on in the street. So I don't know. That's kind of a long winded answer to your question. <laughs> No, I, I agree 100. I think that was a great answer, like to kind of give perspectives both sides. Um, what was like the best piece of advice, like in your entire life, that you were ever given from anybody? Listen more than you talk. Listen more than you talk. Yeah. Why is I, I, that so important? Yeah, I mean it really is, and and that was one thing, and and you know this, you know, being in law enforcement. You know, 99.9% of what you do as a cop is face to face with another human being, whether you're pulling them over to give them a ticket, you're answering a radio run, whatever it ends up being. And then I became, you know, uh, a negotiator. And, you know, as a cop, not only doing the face to face stuff, you can see visual clues. You know, if you're talking to them and they're kind of, you know, looking around, hey, maybe they're going to run or, you know, they start balling up their fists. Maybe they want to fight you. You can see those visual clues. You can do whatever is appropriate. Sit them down, handcuff them, put them in your car, whatever is appropriate. But as negotiators, we weren't with the person. So we had to figure things out based on what people were saying, what they weren't saying, and how they were saying it. And many times, you know, we go down a rabbit hole being like, I don't know, let's try this. And they'd be like, no, you idiot. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay. You know, you kind of got to drop back and figure that out. And I think the biggest thing that I learned about being a negotiator is the importance of trust. And I think that's true in any relationship that you have in your life, because we never lied to people. I mean, people would Mm -hmm. say, you know, I'll put the gun down and I'll come out, but you got to promise me I'm not going to jail. Well, I'm sorry, but when you come out, you are going to go to jail. But and then you would try to deflect the conversation to something Mm -hmm. more positive. And we never wanted to lie to people because there was always the opportunity. And it happened several times where a year from now or two years from now, we're negotiating with that same person again. And if they remember, hey, wait a minute, you lied to me before, then you've lost credibility and you're going to have to bring another negotiator in to negotiate with that person because they don't trust you. And, and it's, it's there's no way you're going to be effective at that. So you're going to have to go do something else and you're going to have to bring another person in. How do you kind of like build that trust with like just like a random person that you don't know their their life story or their background or like you're just being face to face? Like, how did you build that trust in, into somebody? I, I think partially is is you you don't lie to them. You tell them the truth, even mm-hmm. if it's something they don't want to hear. And you I guess the way I describe negotiating is kind of like a teeter totter or a seesaw at the park. You know, we, we've okay. all been on those. And when we start negotiating, the person's emotional and way up in the air and their rational end is down here at the bottom. And all we did, you know, we always said, you know, oh, good job. You know, you talk them out. No, really what we did is we listened them out because we would ask an open-ended question in the hope that they would burn off a lot of that emotional energy by just talking, you know, what's going on. And and so you get that teeter-totter to equilibrium or hopefully over a point in time, where you would get the rational side up in the air and the emotional side down at the, on the ground, because we all know we make better decisions when we're rational as opposed to being emotional. So mm-hmm. we would just ask them questions. And it, it might be simple things like, you know, what do you want me to call you? Not, not what's your name? What do you want me to call you? You know, oh, OK, you know, I, I can be whoever I want to be. I don't have to be this person who's having a problem. I can be this person over here. And, and that's a little bit different. You know, we never gave anything without getting anything. So mm-hmm. somebody be like, you know, I want a cigarette. OK, give me a magazine from your gut. You know, we'll give you a cigarette. And, and so there was always that. And, and you had to be honest. You know, if I say I'm going to give you something and you say you're going to give me something, then I'm going to give you that thing. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to promise you something and then not do it. So I think really is just doing what you say you're going to do builds that trust. But let's be honest, you've been doing this long enough that you know that, you know, to come onto a scene, to even if it's a radio run, you know, for mm-hmm. a domestic or something like that, that domestic may have been building over, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and you're showing up and solve it. And I mean, you know, it's not, it's not realistic to think of, you know, a, a domestic situation that may have been brewing, you know, for 10 years or 20 years or however long these people have been together. And you're supposed to arrive on the scene in 15 minutes, 
you know, and, and, and handle it. I, mm-hmm. I, you know, 90% of the time as negotiators, we were successful at getting the person out safely. 10% of the time, the person chose to end their life. And while that's always tragic, I never, you know, I didn't lose any sleep over them. And I don't mean to sound callous, but, mm-hmm. you know, I knew I did the best I could with the best people and the best training. And it was your choice how this situation was going to end. So, you know, if you chose to end your life, that's tragic, but I know I did the best I could. I like that. What a, how different kind of going back a spin here, uh, how different was it playing basketball in college versus playing in like high school or just playing sports in general versus college and high school? I, it, it was, it was much harder, you know, I, and, and again, I play basketball, you know, my, my nephew actually was a punter on the University of Illinois football team. And so th- they have arranged things. I think today, basketball, football at major universities, those those student athletes are going to school in the summer. So they're mm-hmm. going to take classes so that during the season they can lighten their load and things like that. We didn't do that. I mean, we we took a, a regular load, you know, however many classes that was, five or six classes and still had to play basketball. And I also the college I went to was a military college. So I also had to deal with all the, the military part of it. You know, so you really had to be good at organizing your time and how you were going to use your time. And you, and you had to, uh, you know, you had to bring your books on road trips and things like that. And you had to set time, time aside to study because you weren't going to be successful. You weren't going to be able to, to be eligible to play. So that part was good. I, I had a I had a great coach, Les Robinson, who uh, I, as far as I know, is still the only the only person to be the uh, head basketball coach of three different NCAA schools and also the athletic director at, at those three schools, three different schools, and actually took over for Jim Valvano at North Carolina State way, way back before you were born. And, <laughs> and, 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 and that. But I, I mean, just a great man and a guy who cared about you, not just as a basketball player, but cared about you as a person wanted to, you know, what are you going to do after this? What, you know, what, what, what job are you going to go into? I, I, he, I think he was more proud of how we ended up after basketball than anything we did while we were playing basketball. I see what you're saying. What, uh, so like, I guess besides sports, like what, in general, like what do sports you think in your opinion build up like for life in general? Like what is like the most valuable, like, yeah, you know, you go basketball practices and win the games, but like, what is like the main purpose that like helps succeed in life? Like that somebody can get from playing a sport, like a kid can get from playing a sport. You think? I think one of the biggest things, and this is something I've learned and and I, I think I'm putting it to use now in my cancer treatment is that, you know, being part of a team sport, you know, and I did. I started when I was nine years old and played all the way up till I was graduated from college when I was 21. What that taught me was the importance of being part of something that's bigger than yourself. You know, you know that if you didn't do your job on the team, not only were you letting yourself down, but you're letting your teammates down, your coaches down, your fans down, your parents down, et cetera. And if you think about it, the biggest team game that we all play is this game of life. And I am undergoing a a clinical trial now for a a new drug for these tumors that I have in my lungs that more than likely is not going to save my life, but may five years from now, 10 years from now, save somebody else's life. And I think for me, that's part, you know, in addition to all the other things I've done in my life, being part of something that's bigger than yourself. And you know, as a, as a law enforcement person, you know, we always kind of divide up everything into three parts. You know, there's, there's the sheep, there's the sheep dog and there's the wolf. And, mm-hmm. you know, to be the sheep dog, to be the person that protects other people has always been a passion of mine. Certainly sounds like it's a passion of yours. Mm-hmm. And, and that feeling of, you know, Hey, I'm doing this because it's something that's bigger than me. Yeah, I think being like finding something and especially for me, like finding something that's bigger than yourself is important. Like I think coaching is like a great, great thing. And, and then I think you you said you you coached four years of girls basketball. I did. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's just like something that's like always trying to help. And I think that's great. Um, what 
inspired you to write your book? Is that just like from the get-go of like just your experiences that you've had building up to this? Is it from just your cancer treatment or like kind of what, what helped you with that? So the, the book was really born out of two conversations that I had. One was with a former player who moved to Colorado uh, where my wife and I live with her fiance and we had had dinner with them one night. And I said to her, I'm like, you know, I'm really excited that you're living close and I can watch you find and live your purpose. And she got real quiet for a while. And she looked at me, she's like, well, coach, what do you think my purpose is? I said, I have no idea what your purpose is, but that's what your life should be about. Find the reason that you were put on this earth. You use your gifts and talents and, and get out there and live that. And so that was one conversation. Then I had a young man in college who reached out to me on social media, and he asked me what I thought were the most important things that he should learn to not just be successful in his job or in business, but in life overall. And I didn't want to give him the, you know, get up early, work hard, help others. Kind of, not that those aren't important. They are incredibly important. But I've kind of felt they'd been done. And so I wanted to see if I could go a little bit deeper with them. And so I spent some time and eventually... I had these 10 thoughts, these 10 ideas, these 10 principles. And so I sent them the principle. And then I stepped back and I was like, you know, I've got a life story that fits underneath this principle, or I know somebody whose life emulates that principle. So literally, I had my leg amputated in April of 2020, and I started chemotherapy for the tumors in my lungs in June of 2020. During that time period, I was healing I sat down at the computer every day with these 10 principles and I built real stories, you know, stories of real people's lives and things like mm -hmm. that, not just mine, but other people that I knew underneath those principles. And that's how sustainable excellence came to be. That's incredible. I mean, like your story overall, just like you hear people all the time, like they get cancer, and then they kind of like subside to it. Like just from a mental standpoint, you, you're just like, nah, nope, not taking it. Nope. Give me another one. Nope. That's good. <laughs> It actually reminds me of one of my good friends and a coach that I had, and he, he kind of went through some similar things and, and uh, he just, he doesn't let that kind of stuff just stop you. You can't, you know, I, I think you're like a true test to that. Um, I definitely got to get that book though. It sounds like like just reading your stories and, and your, and stuff like that. It's, it's next to none. Um, what, what is your, and I think you kind of touched on this anyway, but I'm going to kind of like, kind of guess reiterate it. Like what is your life? purpose? And like, how did you know, like when you found what your life purpose was and like at what point for you? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I guess, let me, let me back up a little bit on, on people's purpose. I, I think a lot of times we equate our purpose with our job. You know, we've, mm -hmm. we've got to find our job is our purpose. That doesn't have to be the case. I mean, you could have a job over here that you use to pay the bills, but your, your purpose, your passion, your why is to paint or to write or to be an activist or whatever you feel in your heart. And I always, I always tell, especially young people, if, if there's something in your heart, something in your soul that you feel you should do, but it scares you, go ahead and do it. Because at the end of your life, the things you're going to regret are not going to be the things you did. They're going to be the things that you didn't do. And by then it's going to be too late to go back and do them. So I always think it's, it's important for us to find our purpose. Mark Twain uh, the, the old humorist back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, had a great quote. And this is what he said. Um, oh, shoot, it went right out of my mind. Sorry. Oh, no. The two most important days of our lives are the day we're born and the day we figure out why. You know, we're not all born with the same gifts and talents, but we all have the ability to become the best person that we're capable of becoming. But so many people, and I'm sure you've seen this, you know, just in your law enforcement career, so many people live a casual life. And mm -hmm. as a result, their goals, their dreams, their ambitions become a casualty of that unplanned living. So I think mm -hmm. it's real important for us to kind of get out there, figure out the reason we were put on the face of this earth. And when we do that, you know, it, it, it excites us. It, it, you know, we want to get up in the morning. We want to do whatever we're supposed to do. And so if you're in a job or whatever it is that you're doing and you're not passionate about it, that's probably not your purpose because mm -hmm. your purpose is going to energize you. So when at the end there, you were talking about like how somebody like if they don't, if they're doing something that they're not passionate about, what like what would you say to that person? Like say they're working at Say they are a cop, but they're just not passionate about it. 
what would your like piece of advice for somebody that's just not passionate about what they're doing? And they're like, Oh, well, it pays really good, but I hate my job. Like, what would you like? What, what would you say to that person? You know, and, and I, I'd, I guess based on what you just said, me, I, I, I tell people that, and I know this is easy for me to say, I, I'm kind of old and, you know, mm-hmm. on the way out. I mean, you're young and you're just starting, you know, money, never, 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 never take a job for money. I don't care how much money. And, and I get it. I mean, the benefits is when I was a policeman were great. The money was good, it, you know, it, and, and I had a passion for it. So I kind of had the trifecta there of, hey, this mm-hmm. is all great. But if you're not passionate, and especially, I'm not going to say if you're not passionate, but if you hate what you're doing, get out of it. Just stop mm-hmm. doing it. Find something else to do. Don't do it right away. Don't quit your job and not have anything to do. But find the reason you were put on the face of this earth. I think we were all put here for a reason. I've always believed it's service, whether you believe in, in God or not, service to your God, service to your fellow man. But to serve other people, I think, is always or should be what we're, what we do with life. Now, how we do that is entirely different for each person. And that's based on the gifts and talents that you have, which, you know, Sal, for you is, is unique to what my gifts and talents are and mm-hmm. vice versa. You know, and so, yeah, find that reason. Get out of the if you hate it. Life's too short to be doing something you hate. I agree. Um. So for somebody that's like kind of going through similar uh, medical issues that you've, you've gone through or overcome, like, what would you say to that, for that person? Like somebody who's like maybe lost her, their leg in a car accident or, you know, their arm or something like that. Like, what would you say to that person that's like, oh, well, you know what? It's, that's it. It's over for me. Like, what would you say to that person? Yeah, they, it probably is based on that attitude. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, Winston Churchill, the, the prime minister of Great Britain during World War II had a great quote. And this is what he said. He said, if you're going through hell, keep going. And I think that's that's really important. You know, we, we all have different issues in our life. And, and I, I guess I'll say this. Pain is inevitable in our lives. And, it, and you know, it doesn't have to be a, an illness or a cancer pain or, or anything like that. I mean, you could, it could be as simple as you flunk a test at school, or you break up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, or you don't get the promotion at work that you think you deserve. Pain is inevitable. Suffering, on the other hand, suffering is optional. Suffering is what you do with that pain. Do you take it and use it to make you a stronger, a tougher, a more determined individual? Or do you wallow in it and feel sorry for yourself and want other people to feel sorry for you? So you're looking at me. There's no S on my chest. I don't wear a cape. I have bad days. There are days I cry. There are days I get down. There are days I feel sorry for myself. And when I get into those situations, I remember two stories. One was a professor back in the 1950s at Johns Hopkins University who did a study with rats. And trust me, this will all come together. I'm like, what the heck is talking about rats? You know, he's like, so what it was a very simple study. He took rats and he put them in a tank of water that were over their head. And he wanted to see how long these rats could tread water. And the average rat tread of water for about 15 minutes. And just as the rats were getting ready to sink and drown, he reached in, grabbed them, pulled them out, dried them off, let them rest for a while. And then he put those same rats back in that same tank of water. And the second time around, those rats treaded water for 60 hours. Think about that. 15 minutes, that's all I can do. I'm done, I'm at the end of my rope, can't do anymore, I'm gonna die. Nope, second time around, 60 hours, which says to me two things. One, the importance of hope in our lives. We have to believe that we're working towards something or life is going to get better for us if we're in that situation. And two, just how much more our physical bodies can handle than we ever thought they could handle. I have a friend of mine who's a former Navy SEAL, and we talk about the SEAL's 40% rule, which basically Mm -hmm. says that if you're at the end of your rope, you can't go on, you're only at 40% of your maximum, and you still have another 60% left to give to yourself. So whenever, you know, I guess to answer your question in a long-winded way, leave it to a negotiator, right? So, you know, you would get to the point where, you know, you can do anything you want and just realize that a lot of the impediments that are you're going to face in life are impediments that you put there. If you have even a small amount of grit in your life, you can do almost anything because most people are soft and will quit the first time they butt up against an obstacle. When you, uh, when you talked about that 40% rule, uh, first thing that popped in my head is David Goggins. 
read his book. Yeah. Great book. Uh, the, I listened to that book and th- that man is, that's extraordinary. Like his childhood and what he came through three hell weeks in one year. Like that was like, like crazy. Like that guy, he's that's, that guy's a tough guy there. Uh, so yeah. there, there's another book that you probably would enjoy. It's called living with a seal. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Uh, is that, uh, he's a rapper, right? Uh, well, he was, he was, he also was a rapper, of- right? Yeah, He's part owner of the Atlanta Hawks in the okay. NBA, and his wife is, is uh, Susan Blair? Blakely, who yep. started Spanx. Yeah, uh, yeah, that. yeah. I've listened yeah, to his it, podcast quite a few times. I mean, if you don't, if you know Goggins now, but he doesn't name Goggins until the very end of the book. Mm-hmm. And if you realize what Goggins puts him through, it is amazing. And it goes right back to you can do so much more than you thought you could. Yeah. Um, and actually, I'm going to share like a quick story with you, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, so our coaching, uh, like the, the team I coach with. Uh, so we have a leadership development course that we do every year with the team. And as the coaching staff, we're like, huh, we're doing it with you because we're coaching with you. We're there when we win, we're there when we lose, we're doing it with you. Right. Like that's our mentality. And uh, one of the guys is actually a former Navy SEAL. He comes and does this and like his, his mindset, like he does things with us. Like we're there at four 30 in the morning, going through the mud, going through the ropes, doing these obstacles together. And it's just like, it's interesting. Like what, when he tells you in the beginning what you're going to do, you're like, yeah, we can't do that. And then it's like, all of a sudden you're like, there's just something that like clicks in your mind. It's like, ah, right, well, we're already through this, like not even a third of the way through this, but we're in it. Like we're in the mud, we're in the, the grind. Uh, and, and when you like, you get to a point where you think you can't do it, you can just keep doing it. And I think just think that's fascinating. Like the, the Navy SEAL mindset that they have, the 40% rule, it's just like something that I don't think a lot of people either understand or just don't know about that from a, me- a mental standpoint. So I just think that that's interesting that you brought that up. Yeah, I, I think, you know, and, and I recommend this to people every day, and, and I try to do it myself every day, is to do one thing that makes you uncomfortable, that makes you nervous, that scares you, that could be potentially embarrassing. And it doesn't have to be anything major. It, you know, you were just saying, what if you got up at five o'clock tomorrow morning when you usually get up at seven? You know, mm-hmm. what one thing that makes you uncomfortable. And if you do that every day, when the big things in life come along and they come along for all of us, you lose, you know, somebody close to you, you lose your job, you're living out of your car, whatever it is, when those things happen and they happen to, to all of us, you'll be so much more resilient when those big things happen. If you do just one small thing every day that makes you uncomfortable. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. It's just like being, and I guess this kind of comes into my my next question, um, one of my final questions, like living an uncommon extraordinary life. Like, what does that take to live an uncommon and extraordinary life? And I'm assuming that's part of it is doing something that like kind of scares you every day or something that's tough. Yeah, I, I think that's that's exactly what it is. And and finding your purpose, finding searching for your purpose with an open heart. I mean, a lot of times people, you know, you keep an open mind. What I'm saying is keep an open heart. And, and, you know, I, I've had, I've had people, and, and I think this is important. You know, I had another nurse. It's funny how my stories are only about nurses or sports, you know, that's about <laughs> nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, who, who asked me, you know, what was it like to have your foot amputated initially and then to have your leg amputated? And, and what I've told her is, you know, Cancer can take all my physical faculties, but cancer can't touch my mind. It can't touch my heart and it can't touch my soul. And that's who we are. This is just a facade, a house, a vessel, whatever you want to call it to, to, you know, house, I guess, who we really are. And, you know, I think it's important. I had another nurse. Sorry, this would be my last story. I brought I had another nurse who asked, you know, said to me one day, and she's like 25 years old, a young young woman. And when I first met her, she was in training in the unit where, I, where I'm cared for. And a couple months ago, she was taking care of me on her own. She's like, Terry, I've got a story I want to tell you, but I'm really nervous about it. And I'm like, just, just tell me. I've got a daughter your age. You know, just, just tell me. And she said, you know, when I first met you, I was going to get out of nursing. I, I'd had a good friend die, and I was in a very dark place. I talked to my mom and dad. I was going to quit nursing. I was going to go to work for Amazon. And then I met you. And I see what you go through, the hell that you go through for these treatments when you're here. And I read your story and I knew I was in the right place. I knew I was where I was supposed to be. Now, if she would have never shared that story with me, I would have had no idea 
that my life impacted her. And Sal, you know, there are people out there that are probably, you don't even know, but, mm -hmm. but watch you as a policeman and say, you know what? Yeah, Sal's squared away. I want to be like Sal. But you have no idea who those people are. I think it's important for all of us to realize that there are those people out there that would trade places with us, regardless of where we are, what our status in life is. We lost a leg, you know, we're, we're unemployed, whatever. They trade our places with us in a New York heartbeat. You know, just like that. Yes, mm -hmm. I'll trade places with you. And we have no idea who those people are. And there was a basketball coach at UCLA a number of years ago at a saying that kind of mirrors this. And this is what he said. A careful person I want to be. A little person follows me. I dare not go astray for fear they may go the same way. So I think it's real important for all of us to realize that this just isn't about us. Mm -hmm. This is about us collectively, not about us individually. All right. Uh, final question. What piece of advice looking back on your entire life so far, like what would you give to your teenage self now? Like some, maybe your 13 or 14 or 15 year old self. I guess, I, I guess I would, I'll, 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 I'll answer that with a story. Um, okay. And, and, and I, you've probably seen this movie, 1993, the movie Tombstone came out. Okay. And huge, huge movie. It starred Val Kilmer as a guy by the name of John Doc Holliday. Kurt Russell as a man by the name of Wyatt Earp. Now, Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp were two living, breathing human beings who walked on the face of the earth. They're not made up characters just for the movie. Now, Doc was called Doc because he was a dentist by trade, but pretty much Doc Holliday was a gunslinger and a card shark. And Wyatt had been a lawman his entire life. And these two men from entirely divergent backgrounds form this very close friendship. And at the end of the movie, Doc is dying at a hospital in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, which is about three hours from where I live. The real Doc Holliday died in that uh, hospital. He's buried in the Glenwood Springs Cemetery. And Wyatt, at this point in his life, is destitute. He has no money. He has no job. He has no prospects for a job. So every day he comes to play cards with, with Doc, and the two men pass the time that way. And in this scene, they're talking about what they want out of life. And Doc says, you know, I was in love with my cousin when I was young, but she joined a convent over the affair, but she's all that I ever wanted. And then he looks at Wyatt and he says, what about you, Wyatt? What do you want? And Wyatt says, I just want to lead a normal life. And Doc looks at him and says, there's no normal. There's just life. And get on with living yours. Sal, you and I know, and this is what I tell my 15-year-old self. Don't wait for life to come to you. We know people that are sitting out there like, you know what, when this happens, I'll have a normal life. When that happens, I'll have a successful life. When this happens, I'll have a significant life. Don't wait. Don't wait for life to come to you. Get out there, find the reason you were put on the face of this earth and live that reason. Because if you do, I'm going to promise you two things at the end of your life. One, you're going to be a whole lot happier. And two, you're going to have a whole lot more peace in your heart. That, that was, that's a great, uh, just like everything you talked about in this podcast, this episode was, it was amazing. Um, and it was an honor for you to have and be actually the first episode that we did here. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited. Uh, and I'm, I was excited all day to have, have you on this podcast, uh, just like studying everything that you've gone through and what, what you've become. And that, that, that was amazing. Um, so is there like anything else that you want to, like you could say, or any advice you want to give to like somebody else listening? You haven't touched no, I, I would just, you know, I just tell you, find the reason you were put on the face of this earth and live that reason. And, you know, you, you get to a point, you're like, everybody dies, mm -hmm. but not everybody really lives. And there was a Native American Blackfoot quote that I heard years ago that goes like this. When you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. Think about that. And I think the important thing there is live your life, live your life. If you live your life, death, the end of life, not nearly as scary as all those people who just kind of muddle through. Find the reason you're put on this earth and live that reason. Everything you need to be successful in life is already inside you. You just got to find it, pull it out and use it for your advantage. Thank you. That, that was great. That was great. Thank you. Um, so that's going to wrap up this podcast episode, guys. I want to thank Terry so much for hopping on uh, today and joining us. Um, and you guys got to go check out his book, um, Substantial Excellence, The 10 Principles to Lead You an Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. And that can be found on Amazon, correct? 
Amazon, Amazon Barnes and Noble, Barnes Apple and Noble. Books, yeah. All right, it's all over the place. All right, guys, that's great. Uh, thank you guys again for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next time.